All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate uh, your attendance. We appreciate your uh, attention to this uh, to this issue. It really is important. It's relevant to all of you, and uh, we're excited. I'm excited to to listen to what the chancellor has to say. So before we get started, uh, let me introduce our chancellor. So Chancellor Hagrot has been chancellor of the university system now for I think this is his ninth year. Is that correct? And he comes he uh, his family is originally from North Dakota. He has a, an esteemed career. He's retired from the US military in an uh, went to the Naval Academy spent many years uh, in the Navy on submarines, spent time in uh, Afghanistan and other places of the world. And uh, we're lucky to have him here today. We're lucky to have him as the chancellor of the North Dakota University System Office. Um, so today I'll, I'm gonna let him introduce his topic, but uh, it's it, it really does matter, it's relevant artificial intelligence is a big deal to all of us. And uh, so with that, I'm gonna introduce Chancellor Mark Hagerot. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, so this brief could get pretty blunt and I had some people said you should probably, you know, sugarcoat it. Do you guys want the blunt? perspective or a sugar-coated version? Blunt, okay. Um, all right, so um, thank you for that kind introduction, Dr. Flanagan. Um, obviously, you know, many of you are already, I've already talked to a couple here thinking about this stuff, so I don't claim that I have better answers than many of you here, but, but I've developed a framework I wanna offer with you, how to situate yourself and, um, and the world is not going to be the same. I'm just going to tell us up front. The world that you are now living with may not be recognizable by the time you're my age. Okay, it, it's that big what's happening. And I want to alert you to this and offer framework. And so what I'll try to offer is this framework in the middle here. You can see that, that the world is breaking into three overlapping realms of humans and nature, right? Maybe you come from farms and animals and interact. Advanced robotics. And then this thing that nobody anticipated till about 30 years ago, which is cyberspace. Ancient Da Vinci, the Greeks anticipated robots and other things, but this thing now called the metaverse, people didn't even know how to even talk about it. And you now are living that. The game world, the virtual world, um, and all these are going to overlap and intersect and on top of it in the last year has been an epic breakthrough in AI, artificial intelligence, or as one of the students asked me, some people believe AGI will be artificial generalized intelligence where it will be just as smart as we are. And what will that mean? So the three realms are depicted by the pictures you can see. Robots, this is a real Japanese robot up here. Okay, they're making these things and many of you are working with this. You are in the right place to adapt. I would just say this, the right place to adapt to what's coming, okay? In a technical school. How many here are on the liberal arts track here? And how many are on the CTE track? Okay, I mean, you're, you're the ones who'll be running these machines. This is the internet in 2003. Uh, it, it's beyond imagination what it is. They, they tried to map the nodes, okay? And then on the left here is, is could be here in North Dakota. Um, someone interacting with humans and nature. Um, and and if I know many of us aren't climate change people here, but climate change is very much about preserving nature as as the machines expend more and more energy. So so that's the framework, and I'm going to give you you know perspectives on this and um, and talk a little bit about the history of AI. So what are some of the key points? We are entering a time where literally these new worlds are going to emerge. And the capacity of artificial intelligence to create wealth will be stupendous in the potentially thousands of trillions. 
it's going to extend lifetimes. Already this is happening. Um, and what does our society mean when people can live to be 120 years old? Right now I've been in two conferences where they said people who are in middle school now should plan to live on average to 102. What does that mean when our social security structure is built for people to begin to, you know, pass away in their late 60s and 70s? Um, entertainment, anybody here plays uh, online games, right? I mean, this world is emerging. The capacity for entertainment will will rival the physical world. What does that mean if if your significant other is less interesting than the game world? I mean, our society has never dealt with these issues ever before. OK, um, any veterans here? Any veterans? OK, a robot war is now emerging in Ukraine right now a robot war. It's science fiction happening. Robots are hunting down soldiers right now. And uh, part of my background is, is I was in the Navy with rudimentary robots, autonomous machines. And then eventually, because these writings, I went to the Geneva Convention where a room was filled with 100 ambassadors from around the world arguing over, if you unleash your robots on me, I'll attack you with my cyber weapons and then we'll shoot the nuclear weapons. I mean, a screaming match between two ambassadors so for you veterans who are in the guard or whatnot, this is unfolding in front of us and we need young people to think through this. Um, next point, um, the ability of these machines to then begin to impact us may become unlimited. And we'll talk about that the president of the United States has just issued the largest executive order in the history of any president in 235 years to deal with this. The chief justice of the Supreme Court said the issue of the next year will be artificial intelligence. So again, if I only cause you to say, I need to think about this, then this has been a successful interaction, okay? Um, because it's that big. Um, and so the last point is for you, that you're going to have to be intentional about yourself. And this is for me, when I say you, just I'm, I'm talking to myself, my kids, I'm now a grandfather, but we have to be intentional about ourselves, how we interact with machines and technology, how we adapt our family's interaction, but also your company. Most of you will go off and work in companies and help your companies adapt so that they are successful in this new age. They create wealth uh, and make North Dakota, Minnesota, um, a, a more um, livable, enjoyable place to be. But uh, I'll show you some history to, um, to explain what's happened in the past. Um, so the outline of this brief real quick is I'll talk a little about AI, AGI, what the basics are, then offer the framework using a little bit of history and then I'll offer basically a strategy I would suggest is one of resilience, that you've got to be able to take some blows, you've got to be able to have some setbacks, um, and, um, and that's part of life. It's why it's exciting to be alive. But the last point I'll make, and it's not just me, but several theorists are now saying the people alive right now are literally the most important ever on the history of this planet because we've had in the past wars, we've had revolutions. You know, I know some people get upset about Trump or Biden, they're so mundane. I'm just telling you that again. They are so mundane. You read the history. Julius Caesar's assassinated. You know, Adolf Hitler rages through Europe. Trump and Biden are not a story. This is the story of your generation to adapt to these intelligent machines. We'll get somebody else in the White House. They'll try to run the government. But, but this is the story. And you're alive right now. Um, I had to cut the brief down a little bit, but part of the reason it's so important what you're doing is there are theories of technology called momentum theories. Um, and that is the first generation to deal with the technology will commit future generations to what they did. Now, someone told me this this morning on your staff, this highway system out here, has anybody wondered why I-29 is so far from Wapaton? Have any of you ever thought about that? You're a little annoyed you come down from <laughs> Fargo. To Apparently, the town leaders 40 years ago said, we don't want that gosh darn freeway coming through our town. We're never going to move that freeway now, right? But think of the difference if those town leaders back in 1961 said, you know, we're not afraid of outsiders. We want the freeway to come by. Think of the hotels and the restaurants and the truck stops and then maybe even companies saying, you know, what? we're going to locate in Wapaton because they're right at the interchange. That's what we're talking about is that when you start to make patterns on technology because of the capital intensive investments and the training and people's habits, it locks in. And if you 
forget what I'm saying about this. Every time you look at your iPhone or a computer keyboard, and you look at that keyboard, it's called the QWERTY keyboard. That keyboard is no longer efficient, but it was designed in 1870 because the old typewriters are inefficient. And a few years later, they said, this wasn't efficient, let's change it. But it locked in the typing schools, the training, the machines. So even Apple, without any mechanical devices, uses an 1870 computer design for the keyboard because it locked in. So that's why you're even more important than you thought because your grandchildren don't have to go back, oh, grandpa and grandma, that's what they accepted. And again, another thoughtful student over here said, what about the ethics and the morality of these machines? We lock in patterns of use, right? Um, and I'll tell you, I don't wanna shock anybody, but there's a battle right now in Washington of could you have some type of physical romantic relationships with underage avatars in the metaverse, thinking of child abuse? And there's centers going, that will not happen because it will damage our society. These are the issues your generation is dealing with. I never had to deal with that, but think about that in the metaverse, right? Whose rules, whose policies, and you'll have to decide for yourself and your family. So, so it's a big deal. Spend some time with it. Uh, I forgot my bag there. Uh, I flew through the airport to go visit my grandchild. Time Magazine had a 80 page special edition on artificial intelligence. So even Time Magazine is saying people have to understand this. So, so that's the main message. And so now we'll explain a little bit of background, give a framework and uh, go from there. So we've seen this coming for a long time. Um, this isn't new. And I just wanna point out two points, interestingly, for those of you who are gonna go into the working forces. The first people to anticipate a disruptive effect of machines and automation were working people in mills. It was called the Luddite Rebellion in England. They said, you know what? Automation essentially is coming in. It's, it's destroying our towns, our villages. We need time to adapt. Um, and Britain, for all of its reputation, crushed these people. It was the largest single deployment of the British Army in the history of Britain was to suppress people on mills. Many of you are equivalent of that. They saw something coming and the elites at the time in London made fun of these people. Now drop to the bottom. The actors and writers for the first time in 60 years allied last fall to strike. I don't know if you knew that, but there's a bunch of movies are being delayed. The elites who went to Harvard and Yale are striking to protect themselves from artificial intelligence unemployment. So does that tell you something? Okay, that, that, that they are now doing this. So you have to be very thoughtful on developing your skills and your abilities when, when basically, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio is striking to protect other actors. So we have to be engaged. Now, everything in the middle are interesting. They're movies, they're books, but people were struggling with this, like something's happening in our society. And this is what I'm saying. You, you are now here when this thing is breaking through. I mean, it, it, the, many of these people wish they could live long to see it happen, but you're now gonna be here in November, 2022, ChatGPT breaks out into um, the world. And, um, you know, the President of the United States doesn't write a hundred page executive order for something minor, okay? so that, it's been coming. Uh, there's lots of movies you can watch uh, to, to entertain yourself. And some of them aren't half bad. Um, so um, what is artificial intelligence? Basically, it's nothing magical. This is one definition from Stuart Russell. It's just basically for a capacity machine to take action to achieve its executive objectives. And many of you work basically on artificial specialized machines already. I went and saw the Haas machines and whatnot. These are are lower level intelligent machines. You program them and they do these things. So it's like artificial intelligence is a curve of capabilities, all right? Um, and so we've had that, I had it in the Navy. We had basically, the, these sailors are now, just to know there's a robot war also off the coast of Saudi Arabia. The, the price of oil's gone up. Trade flows are, displ are displaced because of robots. Okay, I'm just telling you right now, the Navy wasn't built to shut down these, shoot down these little robots. And our vice chancellor has two sons in the Navy and the Coast Guard they are exhausted and so we have our own robots watching their robots so it's already happening but they're very specialized they shoot things down you have lathes mills specialized so so artificial intelligence is that general capacity but then you see the word agi where it starts to become able to learn any task and do anything that's that's where this could be going so the history geo fai is just good old-fashioned ai and for some of you program machines was basically just 
you know, Boolean logic, Bayesian networks. Um, but what was the breakthrough was this thing called deep learning and neural networks. The machines were given trillions of bits of data that we all uploaded on Facebook, right? Anybody use Instagram? Okay, do you tag any photos, right? We help teach the machines, right? My daughter loved Instagram and she tagged someone's puppy and someone's kitty and a sunset. So the machine basically sucked all this data down across the world, these machines, and learned that this is what a puppy looks like. And if they have 25 million images tagged by humans, it now knows what a puppy looks like, right? Same thing with all the written words. It kept sucking down all the words, everything people wrote, every poem, every book, and go, well, this, when someone types the word love, this is generally what should be said. So because of this, again, this is why to motivate you, the actors in Hollywood strike, none other than New York Times and a famous actress, I forget her name, Sarah Silverman, I don't know if you knew her, she was famous a few years ago. They've joined a lawsuit against the AI companies because you sucked all our data down and you never paid us a penny. So huge lawsuits are going on at the highest level of the United States Supreme Court on this stuff. Um, but what this then broke through were these what's called large language models, trillions of bits of data, and then this generative pre-trained transformer. It's kind of a mouthful, but it basically means it can generate stuff. It can generate new ideas, derivative of the data. Um, and to just to share with you why you need to be engaged, um, is that <clears throat> when GPT-3 came out, we had the co-founder of it actually uh, is from North Dakota. He went to school in Grand Forks. I don't know if you know that. Brockman's his name. And uh, I've got four pages of notes over there um, when he was talking. I don't think he wanted the lecture recorded. By the way, he showed up with a group of bodyguards. There's been threats to kill him. Um, and he said, they almost shut it down, but they thought, what the heck, let's put it on the internet and see if anybody uses it. Their business case was about 500 people would look at um, their open AI um, chat GPT. It became the single fastest download ever in the history of the internet. So what do you take away from that? Like, wow, that's a pleasant surprise. No, take away this, nobody has a plan. Okay, so what I'm getting at, if you're, if you're waiting for Silicon Valley or someone else to come and tell North Dakota or you how to build your companies, they are overwhelmed, okay? The second point about this company, just before Thanksgiving, the entire board was in a revolution and threw out um, the CEO, who then was put back in by Google and Microsoft. So again, for all of you, think about your careers, think about what you're doing. These are epic things, but in Silicon Valley can't even run the board of one of these companies, it means we really have to be self-reliant and why North Dakota and Jerry's working on this for us to have a moonshot of artificial intelligence training, compute power and all the rest. So we're working on this to help you. You're not alone, but, but, but understand this is coming. Okay, so how do we frame this stuff? Um, you may recognize this guy, Zuckerberg. Um, he rolled this thing out called the metaverse two years ago. Um, literally, it's a completely immersive environment. You wear the, the goggles and whatnot, and they are now building universities around the metaverse. There's companies, games, etc. At the same time, they call for a Bill of Rights for Americans. A Bill of Rights in the White House is studying this. Okay, so, wow, what does that mean? Human rights, a metaverse. Then, just a few months ago, Elon Musk rolls out his robot. That's a robot to his left. He wants that robot to be a home assistant costing less than a car. Well, we know Elon Musk is one of the wealthiest people in the world, so people don't make fun of him anymore. But then at the same time, he calls for this on the right, okay? That we need to put limits on this. So, so again, these are kind of household words, Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook, Instagram, Elon Musk, and they are all talking about this. So, so the point of that is, if you're not a Biden fan, you're not a White House fan, two of the wealthiest people in the world are grappling with this issue, so we should think the same. So what am I offering what they're grappling with? And that is what I showed you before, that literally we have this world now emerging that we have to navigate these intersections, okay? And they told me I can walk over to here and this thing will work, but I'll just point to it for a second. Can you still hear me? Okay. So the point is, this is where we used to be and we'll still be here. This is the interactions you have with your family, unmitigated, unmediated by technology. 
but you're going to have to build a capability like many of you are doing. Your school is a, the right alignment for the future. Some of the schools in our system are, are misaligned for what's coming. You are aligned for advanced machines. I just saw some of the most advanced agriculture equipment in the world you're, you're working on. So you're well aligned to how do these machines work? How do you make them increasingly efficient? But then you have to have a capability with data, massive data that's going to interact with the machines. And we all know this right now. They want to upload agricultural data and all the rest. So you've got to navigate this stuff with your jobs, with your company. And these overlaps, which will have implications in the last few slides, will be about your own mental health and what the Internet could pose a challenge to you or your children. So I'm going to drive a little bit of that. And I know I got it to speed up because already we're at 20 minutes. So so I'll speed it up, Dr. Flanagan. So. So that's what we're going to derive and talk about. So what is a challenge, you know, that I could get to you that, that your generation needs to do? Um, you're going to have to create this technology, right? Inventions. Um, and let's tell you right now, Google does not know agriculture machinery. They don't know diesels. Um, so creating this technology, I'm totally serious. You may build the next app or the patent. Has anybody heard of Bushel Corporation? Raise your hand. Anybody Bushel? Okay. Bushel corporation now trades half of the grain in the United States of America and it was built by two farm boys in North Dakota, Jake Jornstan and his brother. And what they realized was um, there was an interaction going on between farmers and hauling their grain, going to grain elevators, but then needing to link to global grain market prices. And what would they do? Any farmers here? farm families. My dad's a farmer. Typically, a farmer would take the check from the elevator, drive home, hopefully not blow out the window. Then he would go to a bank. Then he'd go on to the markets. The Bushel app allowed the farmer, the grain elevator, the global markets all be connected seamlessly, options, everything they needed. And now this North Dakota company is handling half the grain trades in the United States because Google didn't even understand. I mean, can you believe it for the farmers here that Google never trademarked the word Bushel? I mean, the company's called Bushel, okay? So, so that's what we're talking about here when we're talking about creating the technology. Now, the controlling, cybersecurity is a massive issue. Keeping control of these equipment, think of driverless cars. Cybersecurity is the number one priority of Elon Musk. I heard him give a speech on that. People cannot hack these cars. So think about cybersecurity credentials. When you're taking your classes, you probably need to get a certificate as part of your plan. Now, civilizing, this is for the liberal arts students. This isn't for Google and Facebook to create a new civilization. You may not know this, but North Dakota and Minnesota were bedrock states for the populist movement that helped civilize the Industrial Revolution. I don't know if you knew that. We're the only state with a state bank. We finally said we have to have a bank that takes care of North Dakotans. The only out of 50 states. So North Dakota, the Upper Plains, has a tradition of thinking about things during the Industrial Revolution that other people didn't think about. And then for all the teachers and instructors here, you know, we have to regenerate the next generation of workers, thoughtful people, and that's why you know, this institution is so important. So again, back to that, we'll try to now derive that and start with a little theory. So when I've given this talk, I've given this talk quite a bit. Uh, I gave it at Geneva Convention, Yale University, NDSU, um, National Security Agency, which is all the cyber spies. It's just a framework to think about how to defend the world or prosper. But it was interesting. People have so many different theories about politics, religion, but very few people have theories of technology. Now, for the brevity here, I, I won't go into any more than the one I mentioned to you, and that is this momentum theory. This is well documented that with technological systems, you have to think ahead. Whereas if it's just voting, you can change your decision tomorrow, right? I like Biden today. I don't like Trump tomorrow. But when you start to invest in systems, you have to really force yourself to think ahead. So that's the main theory to take away. There's other theories uh, called technological fatalism, determinism. People, and this, I hate to say this, this is many of the Silicon Valley people. They just believe the machines will dominate and the human race should just fade away. I kid you not. There are people with billions and billions of dollars who believe that theory. Uh, as a Christian American who would love my grandchildren, I think they have a soul. We need to make this world civilized for them. But I'm telling you, there are people in Silicon Valley that if we just fade away, they're fine with that. That's technological determinist. The other school is social centric technology. The technology should help our society, help feed our society. Um, and uh, so 
if you're interested in that, you can Google some of that, but I'll save you that. So, so I'm going to flick through here a little faster, but, but how did I derive those three um, spheres? Okay. And I started this basically, so we'll give the historical evidence and create this. So, so when you think about how the economy worked, basically humans and animals dominated in the cybernetic process. So one of the theories is cybernetic approach to the world. Anybody heard of cybernetics before? Okay, so cybernetics is basically you sense, you think, and then you act. Okay, so a guy in World War II studying how we could shoot down Japanese and German planes said, oh, humans are cybernetic organisms. Anybody ever watch Terminator? They use that word. <laughs> Unfortunately, we can't because of what Schwarzenegger did, but that's what it is. And machines do the same. So basically, for 100,000 years, humans dominated sensing, thinking, acting, leveraged with some tools and some animals. And this is a depiction, an ancient depiction of, of Europe of, of warfare, right? So what began to happen? So it depicted that human factors are essential at the bottom and then advanced machine factors at the top. So think of now moving up this ladder. So in war, we still have human centric uh, interaction, right? But then we invented a thing called the tank. Anybody here ever watch war movies? Okay. World War II, World War I became the emergence of machines on the battlefield. So this brief evolved trying to study with military students where technology is going. So you start to see the evolution of human-centric, machine-centric, and so on. But this same model um, then expands further into robots. So these are some of the robots fighting right now. That, that robot Gatling gun is what's shooting down drones against the oil tankers right now. It's called the Vulcan Phalanx. Totally automated. It just turns on and does its thing all night long. So this is the world of humans, robots, and then we'll get into when cyberspace. So, so that's how it came about, these three spheres. But a massive disruption happened to our social structure built on machines. And that was basically the Civil War, okay? So all of you future mechanics and whatnot, should be very proud that when the United States was built in the South, it was built on human labor, right? That was slave labor. They were the machines. And they wouldn't give it up. So the abolitionist movement said, you have to give up slave labor. It was the power of their economy. But so many machines were in New York alone. New York had more engineers, technicians, people like you. They could produce more guns, artillery, ironclads than the whole South, just the state of New York. And so I want to be very positive about this, that the emergence of machines steam engines, craftsmen like you, was the indispensable thing that freed 4 million people from bondage. So if anybody says industrialization was bad, machines are bad, just refer to this, okay? Literally, it was the machines that freed those people, along with a lot of Union soldiers. Well, what about here in North Dakota? So these are some pictures of my family. My family homesteaded before statehood. That's my grandpa. He was a tough guy, World War I Army soldier, and literally he's in the bull by the horns, literally. There's his uncle, and you can see the animals pulled rudimentary machines. And that's how they started in North Dakota, right? And then my grandfather and his brothers convinced the great-grandfather they needed to buy steam engines. The Hagros were among the first people to buy steam engines, okay? And within a generation, that's 1910, within a generation, the horses are gone and my grandfather is doing this by himself. So if you look at the pictures, the horses that you saw here are replaced by the steam engine. And then you can't see the background, but there's two dozen farm workers in the background. And by 1938, they're gone, okay? So now I'm getting to the sugar coating part. This all seemed okay, because what you had emerge was basically this. Human-centered agriculture, the Amish still do some of the stuff on the bottom, but cattle grazing, and now machines, mechanized combines, etc. That all seems okay, except this, okay? So how many know Microsoft Corporation? Okay, huge company. The CEO of Microsoft came and spoke about this curve. What you have in red are horses and mules. Horses and mule populations went up about 15,000 years in the last ice age. 
In 1910 to 1920, they peaked. This has never happened before. They were replaced by the tractors. And what Brad Smith said is when this happened, for the farmers, you'll understand, all the land that was devoted to oats and alfalfa and hay shifted to cash crops and crushed the commodity markets. This destabilized the banks and led to the Great Depression. He left the stage saying, something like this will happen again with the emergence of AI. We just don't know what it is, so you need to be resilient in your work, in your home, and how you look at the future. So what I'm showing you here is the emergence of these new structures, industrialization, led to some massive effects. Now, I'll just flick through these other slides because we know this. It depopulated much of the countryside. Some of you are from small towns. This would be shocking for my great-grandfather to see these small towns depopulating, but it happened. So the question with artificial intelligence, will the large cities with millions of suburban people still have meaningful jobs? And I just want to assure you, for this audience, this actually came from your president. This is jobs impacted by artificial intelligence. The most stable jobs going in the future will be HVAC, agriculture, manufacturing, processing, chemical processing. So you are very well aligned to exploit the benefits of AI, be more productive. Now at the top of this graph are a bunch of jobs that are gonna go away. So I just wanna assure this audience that you're, you're well positioned for this disruption that's coming. So that was industrialization. Um, so that's a simple, the world modified by machines and robots. And then October, 1969, the internet came alive. Nobody anticipated this. And literally in my lifetime as a college student, you could have put it on exam, draw the internet. And that's what the internet looked like in 1980, about 30 nodes. Those are the undersea cables that lead to this thing here. So, so this is truly a, a stunning development that nobody saw anticipated. So how to think about the world now, I'll put them together, is you have the interaction we have here. If I took my glasses off and I didn't speak in the speaker, we'd be totally interacting as humans with no mediating technology. Then you have robots, advanced machines, which many of you are working on. And we have this explosion of digital, virtual, and the thing that, anybody heard of twinning? Anybody heard of twinning? Okay. Where they think is probably going on those overlaps is there'll be lots of twinning of cyberspace reflecting your machines and actually doing diagnostics through the internet and then finally going to your machines to work on it. At dinner last night, someone was talking about, I think one of the members of the board, state board is here, um, and I think it was him who mentioned um, that uh, they are doing diagnostics on drones in battlefield areas by twinning down in the virtual areas, then the drones land quickly, they know which part to replace, and then it takes off again because of the connection. So real world applications. Um, agriculture, now this is agriculture, right? You've got to have good skills with animals, people, with the machines, but also understanding the data. This is how Bushel is going to probably be a billion dollar company. People a few years older than you because they put those three things together, help a farmer driving his truck to a grain elevator to get to global markets, all the way that's secure and cyber defended against hackers. Um, another example would be um, power plant operations. I know you guys don't do a lot of that, but the power plants now, thank God, in this 27 below zero, they're functioning, but you still got to deal with HR, human relations and labor shortages, human machine control, and then robots, actually doing the inspections on the wind towers now. I don't know if you know that, the robots are doing the inspections in the wind towers. So we don't have people falling off these towers like used to happen. We've got a wind farm right next to my dad's one. Um, this is manufacturing. This was Bobcat, I wanna thank him for their photos. You still have humans, human labor issues, human machines, and then you have one company called Baxter. They said their robots build their robots now. It was interesting, Will Smith in the movie, I, Robot, said, is that a good idea, robots replicating robots? But if there's manufacturing, perfectly fine. So that's that world. Where do you develop new ideas, efficiencies in your work? Because the new students need to be able to do that. Um, medical, anybody here, dental tech, medical? Any dental techs? I visited the dental lab, yeah. Incredibly advanced technology. They showed us one digital simulator that was 40,000 for that alone. But I can tell you, the people in Google aren't inventing those. It's people that are working with the stuff that's inventing that stuff, okay? So, but you still gotta have empathy. And one of the laws, just so you know, for the person who was asking about the ethics, was we have to stop fake empathy. 
that you can't have a robot going to a nursing home with your great grandmother and holding her hand and she thinks a human's with her as she's in her final days, but it's a robot, okay? Now guess what? Other countries, I believe Japan is perfectly fine with that. So for those of you who are in the nursing or the dental area, this human connection I think will be one of the one of the lines our society draws, but that'll be up to you. You know, I'm in the twilight of my career. That'll be you talking to your legislators. By the way, there is a legislative study committee on artificial intelligence. So if you're not impressed with President Biden, your own legislature and the governor are working on these issues. And then, um, what's the next one? Okay, so that's basically how we got there. Um, the AGI AI is just a massive development because the whole idea about this is it can begin to augment all of these things, which we've already kind of touched on. So just bouncing ahead. So what is my recommendation to you as a human being going forward? Nobody can know the future, okay? Um, I mean, it's nice if you're an HVAC to have this, this study here by uh, the World Economic Forum to tell you you're pretty good, uh, but others it's unknown, right? So this would be my recommendation as you go forward um, in this unknown, is think about these different realms Think of the interaction, um, and there'll be incredible job opportunities in these different places. Think of just student health, mental health affected by cyberbullying. Add AI to cyberbullying. In the last three slides, we'll get to that. My wife and I have done several talks about um, student mental health and, and what we're dealing with. But So think about situating yourself in your industry. I can tell you this right now, LinkedIn and Indeed.com have said, a main determinant on hiring new young people is do they have a certificate or two in artificial intelligence, okay? So we are working right now uh, in the university system through the Dakota Digital Academy to offer a digital literacy certificate with some fundamentals of AI. But I can tell you, Dr. Flanning is working hard on it, but we've got to offer that to you and we've got to go faster for you. So you have that on your resume. Because the older employees don't want to deal with it. They want your generation to deal with that, okay? So first off is just, I would just really encourage you to keep doing what you're doing for this, this faculty here, The day to day you do your job, okay? There's a lot of angst about what's coming, but just day to day you get out of bed and reliably do what you gotta do. Now, this reference in the words here about thermodynamic processes, I think we all get it in minus 27, that just feeding people, keeping the lights on is a major accomplishment but also passing the knowledge to the next generation and preserving the data. You can see data banks here. The data is costing so much now that some of my friends who are working with AI cost five cents an interaction. So it's on us to find an economical way that you can have more access to these machines and data. But in day-to-day -day operation, we're getting the job done. And I know you've got your CIO here somewhere in the audience. You should thank him for just keeping these networks running. There you are. because. They're being pounded on every day. I took the slides out, but I have an image of the global cyber attacks every day. The Chinese, the Russians are trying to get into everything, steal everything. They want to get John Deere's data. They want to get Case IH's data. So this is happening in his office each day. So the second thing for the faculty, staff, and for you is when you start to see something you need to adapt to, engage it, adapt, okay? Um, because that's what it's about. And if you notice, for those of you who live through COVID, the classroom's emptied out. Students worked remotely, and those were all of our data servers at your CIO, and they adapted. Other states had basically collapsed. They didn't have themselves set up for adaptation. The students lost learning time, so your college and others adapted quite well. Um, but then the third thing you've got to be able to do is be alert for transformation, and that's really hard. Um, and people go, well, what's the difference between adaptation and transformation? So I've found one that works the most, and that is continuous improvement of the candle did not lead to the light bulb, right? I mean, for thousands of years, we had kerosene candles, we had whale oil candles, um, and then finally got him, Thomas Edison said, we gotta think completely differently. So just continuing to work hard and adapt did not help those candle companies. So if there's something that's related to transformation, both in the faculty, the staff, like we've never done that before, it's time to think about what will AI do that you want to change. So, um, I'm gonna move a little further here because we're down to 15 minutes, I have time for questions. So, so anyway, um, general recommendations, higher education, business, labor, they all need to get together to think about improving lives because I tell you, there is no cavalry coming. Google, Facebook, Microsoft are in a massive battle over controlling this stuff and they have no time or capacity to help you make your lives better or your community. This is all, I know we've got the mayor sitting here, really need to think about what that means for society. 
Um, in particular, what would that mean? Um, you know, the governor of the United States, or the president of the United States and our governor are uniquely qualified um, and already we're working on this. These people down here in this picture were the top 20 tech executives in the world, all came to Washington to help advise them and they all agreed we have to find a way to regulate and make things better. Now they had no answers, but they agreed. Um, I actually did have a cyber thing. This is one snapshot of the world on any one day. There's entire organizations devoted to try to defend you, but a lot of this starts with you knowing where to go on the internet. So I encourage you to be informed. In addition to thinking about AI, think about your cybersecurity, your data, don't give it away um, because it's just crucial to your economic well-being and the campuses that the data secure. And the last one, which will lead to a couple slides, is your own self, okay? Um, this is an epic problem, okay? Um, it already developed with Facebook, Instagram. Um, did anybody remember the, the Facebook whistleblower? Facebook whistleblower was recognized in the uh, State of the Union address. The president had her stand up. She saw they had data how to addict young kids to the internet and they were going to make money off them. And so she risked imprisonment and the president basically offered a partner. Facebook was so embarrassed they shut down Facebook kids, but they were actively trying to work to addict kids to an online platform. Um, so this is now going to be energized. I need to alert you to be aware of this, that your internet usage, whether it's gaming or pornography or other things, um, is now beginning to have huge health effects. Um, anybody recognize this girl here on the left? What is that? Yeah, this is a computer generated girl. She has millions of followers. She is influencing young teenage girls and she isn't real. And these companies are extending values and norms to young adolescent girls in particular based on what they believe is true. OK, so for those of you who are eventually going to get married and have children, be thinking about this, like how are the values and norms coming through the Internet now superpowered by AI, which will read your Facebook, your Instagram, your postings, begin to identify you and all of a sudden offer to be a companion. And what is that going to do? So just be alert for that. Um, the, the image on the right is a famous painting about when the Industrial Revolution happened. They had a, a, an event called Anime, which basically was a wave of depression and loneliness as people got isolated from their villages. There's a fear that this is happening again, that as people extract themselves from human community um, and get more connected to machines. So just be mindful of that. So what are some of the more specific things about this? And this is just one slide from the brief my wife and I gave. This was her slide. The data is now accumulating that your brain is being affected by online uh, usage, okay? Um, you basically have like four systems that, that when you do something pleasurable, you watch a sunset with your significant other, you go fishing with your grandpa, it releases endorphins and you feel good about that. When you're in the game world and you're having this massive stimulation, by the way, paying for it, these other events now, if you're like, it never, it's not as fun with grandpa anymore. I know the mayor goes ice fishing, right? And you said, you got to, do you have grandchildren yet or not? No, not yet. All of a sudden it's not fun being with grandpa. Actually, my girlfriend's a bore. I, well, you're not wrong. It is literally undermining human interaction on the pleasure system because you're getting the endorphin release in the game world, which by the way, is charging you for these interactions and becoming incredibly wealthy. So just be aware of that. Also tranquility. There is a correlation with the amount of usage of young adolescent boys with you know, violent games and then acting the violence out. What a shock, okay? Um, it's also having an effect on your memory. If, you're, if your mind is being constantly interrupted, and I, I will I'll be admitting, I have two of these things, okay? <laughs> one for my family, the grandchildren, the FaceTime, and one for the business. So I'm, I'm just as bad, so I'm not talking at you. This is affecting me. When I went through a difficult time um, years ago, I literally would get like almost a panic attack when my phone would buzz because I thought it was another issue exploding, right? I mean, and I couldn't get away with it. And finally, my wife said, turn the thing off, leave it downstairs, do not have it near your, your bed, okay? Um, and then this affects learning, okay? Uh, the data is all coming out now that if you're having trouble learning, remembering stuff, you need to shut this off while you're studying. I don't know, do, do you allow these phones on the, on the shop floor when you're working the Haas machines or do these things shut down? Do you know? Just wondering. 
But this this breaks your your thought process of learning. So just be aware of these things. Um, and, um, and and so the last thing for the liberal arts students, uh, you'll like this slide. Um, back to the question one of the students going, OK, so is AI going to take over? We have a problem. This guy is Stuart Russell. He's a leading uh, scientist who's been working on this for years. He's been like knighted by the Queen of England. He's a Brit who now is an American. And anybody ever seen the movie Wally? -E? OK, I I've never laughed so hard, right? <laughs> it's just like, but he says, the fear is not the machines taking over. He says it's going to be uh, complacence. It's going to be humans just not caring about the real world, just not paying attention, uh, becoming overly dependent. Um, and so his final conclusion in his book was we have to have a cultural awareness of resilience and, and ruggedness, much like North Dakota, that you have to be able to fix things and do things and be rugged, be physically fit, uh, because the machines will tend you to the Wally -E type phenomenon. They're not going to take over. Why would they want to take over my living room, right? I mean, <laughs> it's ridiculous. But the money incentives will uh, potentially put pressure on you to stay engaged in your community. So the wrap up slide is, is these are the challenges. Create this technology, help your companies prosper, consider trademark patents across the field. Um, think about cybersecurity of everything you do. It's, it's Elon Musk's number one priority. Obviously, he can't have a virus going through his fleet of autonomous cars. Um, those liberal arts students, you're in a tradition in North Dakota where um, the first, I'll just put this, Amazon until North Dakota and South Dakota went to the Supreme Court, did not pay taxes. North Dakota sued Amazon first, South Dakota followed, and the Supreme Court finally said, you know, we should have listened to North Dakota 93, we're listening to South Dakota in 2018. The Dakotas changed the history of the world by some law students working their way all the way to the Supreme Court. So the upper Midwest still has a tradition of common sense. And, um, and then lastly, for the teachers, the educators, you know, we've got to get the next generation ready. And, um, and, you know, as we said earlier, you know, we're going to retire and you're all going to take over. So with that, I still left 12 minutes or almost 15 minutes for any questions, if you have any questions. So I'll stop there. And I think uh, the pandemic probably sort of heightened that idea. Your presentation here kind of emphasizes the social aspect. So, what are your thoughts about how we deliver education? Yeah. No, it's a great question. Um, there's a guy named Brian Alexander that we had, a futurist, came and talked at the state board. So we, we are trying to grapple with these issues. We need to give you the tools, the resources to help you build a better life and and, uh, and take care of our state. Um, and he said he thought there were these three models were gonna emerge. One would be an entirely virtual online and that could become the metaverse. You literally put an Oculus glasses on and you walk in, there's my science class, there's this class. And then if you do the twinning with machines, you actually work on a John Deere tractor or something, right? Um, and there's some schools experimenting with that. Then there would be a mixture, people on premise doing some of that, and they do both. And then he said there could be some that, that realize the massive negative effect of technology on community and human interaction and actually make their campuses, if you can get ready for this, technology free. You literally lock up your phone in a little case. You don't have gaming. You don't have laptop. Everything is in the class, interacting with humans. So the value is in human interaction. Because I have to admit, I mean, I'm a marginally interesting person, but if my wife had the chance to interact with anybody from Hong Kong to Singapore, she'd like, there's somebody more interesting on the internet than listening to this guy, right? You know, but we try to spend time together and go on walks and we've got our own farm and not not have, you know, the internet compete, you know, with my wife. So so great question. I think it's gonna be a mixture, but there are many people who are place bound. They they don't have the money to come here. So so we need to allow them the option to learn from a distance as well. That's my thought. But Others may have different opinions. You're helping create that. Yes. I was wondering, you had that uh, list with the different jobs that you need to stay for more likely to stop being available. The one along there with agriculture, I, I wasn't how the how they got that list at all. They would you know, already be in a self-driving tractor, so we got autonomous tractors to just move on, right? And then, you know, AI with better diagnostics 
Well, it's it's very respected. It's a massive consulting firm, and this um, my guess is um, that um, you're going to have to be able to fix the stuff, right? That that uh, that you know some of the most at risk are purely back to think about the metaverse. That the activity they have can be completely done without moving parts, other than a massive database and an algorithm. They are replaced. Like the the most at risk is designing databases, right? You think about it. A machine runs on data. Right, that would be the natural thing to make a better database. But there used to be a whole career of database management, right? You know, but uh, but my guess it's because tractors get stuck in the mud, right? Uh, you got to change out oil filters. You know, you have to work on the equipment. The the cost of building a robot that could go through mud and snow and ice and crawl under a tractor and, and just the, the cost would be exorbitant, right? So so I think you're safe if you're working in agriculture. Um, I'll ask this one: Are there any farmers here? Any farm? Raise your hands a little higher. Okay. Tell your mom and dad don't sell the land. Okay. Because the other interesting thing, before I got ready for this last time, I, I watched some of Stuart Russell's um, lectures. Okay. He wrote his book, Human Compatible, in 2019. Then he updated some lectures. And I was double tasking when I listened to him, and I took, a, I was dual tasking, and I took a double take. He said, Artificial intelligence will explode longevity, will create wealth you've never imagined. The entertainment will be tremendous. He goes, the communities are going to come under stress, so we're going to have to emphasize human community. But he said, there's one thing it cannot solve, and I have no answer. What do you think there will be a problem in the future? I just gave you a hint. He said, if you combine massive wealth creation, you know, a billion Indians become wealthy. Globalization, they love to travel. There won't be enough land for everybody to enjoy the open space. So he said, that's the problem. And then he said, wealthy people love to have five acres and a house. There won't be enough land. So he said, the, the real conundrum is having a super wealthy society that has to get used to living on top of each other is what he said. So for those family who have land, probably hang on to it till you know, because that was totally unexpected to me. But more than I think about it, has anybody here tried to get into Glacier or Yosemite or Yellowstone in the summer? <laughs> Don't even try. I mean, it's a five hour wait. It's full of people from around the world that love our country. They want to come here and visit, which is great. But, you know, there's there's not enough room in the summer, you know. And so anyway, that's one last thought back to why agriculture will be so important to feed people, but also recreation, open space, et cetera. Other question. Yeah. The one on the right, I guess you were who I don't know who was faster, but. OK. So he said, what would you do to prepare? OK, there's a, a book by a truly visionary a college president um, who wrote a book called Robot Proof five years ago. He's Northeastern president. My vice chancellor was just rereading his book. And correct me if I'm wrong, Jerry. He said you need to have good liberal arts to be able to communicate critical thinking. There's so much false information. You have to be able to decipher this stuff. You need to have a, a, a capability to work with data right? Because the massive data is, is coming and going. And it was a third, Jerry, the mechanical skills, basically. Yeah, you're, this school is perfectly positioned. Liberal arts language so that you're not controlled, okay? The massive information that's flowing, you can discern it, understand it. You understand data. This is good data. This is corrupted data. And then having mechanical skills because of the explosion in robotics. So I think you're getting probably everything you need here. I would just add cybersecurity to that you know, secure machines, right? Uh, and so so I think Wapiton is positioning you well. We, we've got to help him roll out like an AI certificate and other things because we, we've got to do that as a system. So I think you're in pretty good facade. You had a question next to him? Yeah.
So, so he's asking why is everybody so afraid of artificial generalized intelligence? And, and like I said, Elon Musk, the wealthiest man on the planet, said we had six month moratorium to slow the move to AGI. Also, OpenAI is this most influential company maybe in history. And before Thanksgiving, it was on all the headlines. The board voted out their CEO, who they said was out of control. And the main guy that was orchestrated his removal was along what you said. We need to slow this down so we have human compatible AI. And then within a week, Microsoft, Google, and others who hold shares depose the whole board and put the CEO back in. And the CEO's philosophy is go as fast as you can and make as much money as you can. I mean, that's that's so there's a battle right now. I'm just saying there's a battle going on right now on the moral ethical issues. So my opinion, why people are afraid, um, you know, I just, I don't think that artificial generalized intelligence is to worry about my living room and what's going on in my living room, okay? I just, I don't think it cares. I think it's what you were talking about. It's, it's an arms race. Um, a lot of theorists knew this time was coming. I, I put up the slide of all these people saying this, this is coming, okay? And, uh, the example they give is horses. Okay, you notice I just threw the horses up there. Okay. Horses were central to human society. Okay. How many of you have seen movies with with you know the you know the horses like the companion to the human, right? They just weren't work things. They were actually an integral part of the economy. I live in downtown Mandan, inherited my mom's house. There's still horse barns downtown. I just love that. You know, here we are with robots and cyberspace, and there on Third Avenue, there's a horse barn there, okay? And the point that a guy named Yuval Harari, who wrote a book called Homo Deus, which is a page turner, it's about the emergence of AI, said, if humans do to horses what they loved and basically got rid of them, if machines become hyper-intelligent when they really are running everything, utilities, plants, manufacturing, what will they do with us? So I'm not saying I subscribe to that, but that's their their fear is that if it becomes hyper intelligent, it's connected by the internet with everything else. And it has the power to turn power off and do stuff. And it starts to go, why do we have all these people? Okay. I don't subscribe to that. What I subscribe to more in my military hat is whoever gets to AGI first will probably become the dominant superpower. And none other than Vladimir Putin has said this, whoever gets to win the race of artificial intelligence will break all the codes, take all the money out of the banks, ground all the airplanes, checkmate, and now we're in control of the world. So I think that in my national security background, I'm still on the advisory board of the sector of the Navy. That's what we're talking about really is human machine resilience. And I've just published an article in the Dakota Dis Review saying we need to slow down de-skilling human beings so that you all can still take manual control of something, right? Like if there's a problem, if, you're, if your tractor gets hacked during spring planting, there is a manual control that a farmer can still, I mean, think about this for the farmers here. If China would unleash a massive cyber attack for two months during spring planting, you will starve a third of the world. Think about that, right? We don't, unlike biblical Egypt, where they kept seven years of grain. Remember the stories of Joseph and the grain? He said in the dream, store seven years of grain. That's how Egypt's society survived. We have just-in-time delivery. We, we've got our, our storage down to fairly limited margins. But if you have a massive cyber attack on all this ag equipment, it would be an existential event. So needless to say, cybersecurity of agriculture infrastructure is becoming really important. But that would be my thought, is that unfortunately we have a world that's very dangerous. And if you combine AGI with cyber warfare, um, that would be that would be the risk I would see. But other questions? These two are obviously their brain trust over here. They got more questions up there somewhere. Oh yeah, in the back row. Well, um, so the question was a lack of feeling and control. Is that what I'm getting at? That Facebook and all these are very powerful? Is that what I was hearing you saying? Yeah. yeah. Well, I would say this, that, that your choice with your family, your friends um, to, yeah, and please don't hesitate. If you need to go, we're, we're, we're going over now, um, is that you build your world, your life. I'll, I'll tell you this right now, that the leading executives 
of these tech companies have their children go to what's called Waldorf schools that have no social media, no internet till sixth grade. So they are protecting themselves from those influences until their children become older. So I would say, you know, talk to your friends. Um, you know, my kids are younger and they talk about when they go out, they all put their iPhones on the table at dinner. So no one looks at the iPhone. So they just interact. So I think, you know, you can carve something out, you know, and who knows, maybe part of your innovation is a social movement, right? In that whole realm of, you know, how, how does one live in the age of digitization and AI, right? So, so, and remember the state of North Dakota and South Dakota together changed the whole tax structure of the world. So we can do that in North Dakota, but, but get involved, get involved in student government. That's what I'd say. Don't, don't try to do it yourself. Find other like-minded people here on the campus. Any other questions? Again, if you got to go, please go. It's, um, you, he has another question. Can I let him ask another question? He's, he's got a lot. Okay, go ahead. Just say it loud enough so they can hear you. So what was the most influential moment in technology? I can tell you exactly what it was. Uh, my family has been farming since 1885 and uh, my dad is pushing 90 and he was alive when great grandpa Ernst came from Germany and broke this field by Crown Butte. So if you drive to Dickinson or Medora, you'll go by Crown Butte. There's a lake there now and it's this very unique butte right west of Mandan. And I'm standing there waiting for us you know, to I guess put more fertilizer in the drill or whatever it was. The farmer next to us had rented it out to a big agribusiness and the tractor was essentially driving itself. And we were told that there were some people from Singapore that might invest with them as long as it's a family. And it just kind of hit me the speed at which this is changing. That my father, who knew Ernst Hagerot, sat on his knee, who broke those fields with a four horse iron bottom plow. In my dad's lifetime, there's a GPS controlled tractor with maybe Singapore investors going to control that land. And I just, it just kind of hit me. This was like uh, seven years ago. Like, this is the speed at which this is going in one man's lifetime. So that's what I would say is the speed is pretty rapid. Uh, and so you got to be informed and think about this. But the main thing, back to the, the theme, be resilient day to day, show up for work. I met a bunch of you, you just you're great young people. Just show up for work, be the best worker, and then be alert to adaptation, like, hey boss, we can do this better. And then be willing to say, we're trying to improve the candle here. We gotta make the light bulb, right? You know. And, um, and again, back to the Jornstead brothers, um, they've created a company. So I guess the gentleman left, but they didn't feel disempowered. Like, hey, is anybody making a good app for grain dealers and farmers? And guess what? What they told me is the grain farmers did not want to use a Google app because Google came out later. They wanted to trust a North Dakota company, right? So think about that, building on your brand as a North Dakotan here, applying AI new techniques to what you know, because the Google engineers don't know agriculture, right? They don't know manufacturing. That's, that's not what they do. So I think there's a, there's a big area of integrating AI and digital technology to what you already know and make your machine smarter and more effective. Um, and, and also the culture in is different than Silicon Valley. You're seeing things they may not see, right? And this, for those of you who are more social minded, how do you help young people adapt to this stuff, right? You know, and, and maybe you're never as big as Google, but maybe you build a company that Midwest South Dakota, North Dakota, Montana really like your product. And guess what? Because of the reputation of Silicon Valley, they don't want to use that app from Silicon Valley. See what I'm saying? So again, I wish that the young gentleman there, he felt a little hopeless, but I think there's something like that happening. People want to buy local and be connected with local, know their data is local. The Vice Chancellor Ross and I are working on this proposal with the governor that maybe we need to begin to store our data in North Dakota. Because the last thing I'll say is when they say AI has a bias, it's not a bias, it's reflecting the values of the creator, right? The creators, I guess you said the same thing in Seattle and Silicon Valley have a bias. Like I told you, some of them are techno technopoly fatalists, technology fatalists. That's not like North Dakota is. So maybe our data, how it's built and how it's manipulated. And we've got one of our members of the state board, you know, who votes on these things. We have to build out a business of data storage that reflects our algorithms, our software engineers, you know, but uh, anyway, okay, I better let people go. You're very kind to sit here longer. I know the administrators can't walk out in front of me. <laughs> but anyway. 
you, I wish I could trade places. You got a whole life ahead of you. You're going to live longer and more healthier than you thought, but just protect yourself on some of those other things like we talked about, the pleasure system, tranquility, learning. Take care of yourself and your family. Thank you.